So we are glad to have now Professor Elias Ocon from the Institute for Philosophical Research of UNAM, Mexico. He will speak about on the objectivity of measurement outcomes. Please, Elias, go on. Okay, hi. Um, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Thanks to the organizers. So, um, yeah, I guess let's, uh, let's start because I don't have uh, much time. So the starting point of um, my talk is as follows. There are a number of recent arguments, which uh, by the way are becoming very popular, which uh, seek, seek to challenge the objectivity of measurements. So um, what are these arguments? Where they, they involve um, so-called extended Wigner's uh, friend scenarios, which are scenarios in which entangled systems are shared by sets of Wigner's friends arrangements. These Wigner's friends arrangements, as you probably know, are settings, are settings in which um, somebody measures a system inside a closed lab, and then a Wigner or an, a so-called super observer comes and measures the whole system uh, after the, the friend measures the, the thing inside. And uh, these um, uh, arguments claim to show that the assumption that the experiments performed by the friends inside of the, the labs yield definite outcomes, that that assumption leads to a contradiction. So from that, it is concluded that the results of at least some uh, measurements, measurements performed by macroscopic observers, cannot be thought of as being actual or objective. Well, these um, um, new arguments, as I said, are um, these extended Wigner's uh, friend scenarios. They are also called the uh, Wigner, uh, I'm sorry, Bell Wigner uh, mashups, uh, because they basically employ settings that have been used to derive Bell type uh, results, such as Bell's uh, setting or Hardy's or GHZ's. Uh, uh, um, but they place in each wing of these experiments a Wigner's uh, friend arrangement, as I said. And uh, this procedure allows to employ, um, um, in opposition to Bell standard uh, setting, they allow to employ on each run of the experiment measurement settings that in standard Bell type experiments would correspond to different possibilities, right? So in, in, in one setting, you can measure like all different uh, options that you could um, measure. Because of that, this, um, Arguments are doubted um, as being formulated in terms of actual results of measurements and not in terms of uh, dubious theoretical constructs such as uh, counterfactual statements or Bell's lambdas or ontic states or stuff like that. One such argument um, is uh, given by Posse and Masanes. I will call this argument the PM argument. It, it involves a Bell type setting in which uh, the particles of a, set of a singlet are sent to two different labs with, as I said, Wigner friends arrangements uh, in, each, uh, in each wing of the experiment. And um, uh, by assuming that uh, the friends obtain definite outcomes, um, an incons inconsistency is claimed to arise. Another such uh, uh, argument is offered by Sukovsky and Markievicz. I'll call this argument the ZM argument. And they um, um, also use an extended Wigner's first scenario, but this time they, instead of using Bell's uh, setting, they use the GHC's arrangement, which is a, a variant of, uh, of a Bell type uh, argument. And um, Similarly to PM, they conclude that any attempt to introduce an actual outcome for the friends measurements leads to a contradiction, to a logical contradiction. These two arguments are in fact uh, motivated by a more famous result by Frau Schiger and Renner, and I'll call this uh, the FR argument. And FR considers an extended Wigner's friend scenario again, this time modeled by another variant of, of Bell, uh, Bell's uh, theorem, uh, uh, namely Hardy's paradox. And the home conflict in this case is argued to arise from the assumption that quantum mechanics can in fact be applied to macro macroscopic systems. And uh, from that they conclude um, that quantum theory cannot consistently, consistently describe the use of itself, whatever that means. I'm not sure if I understand what, what they mean by that, but we will come back to, to this. So, what am I going to do in this work? I will um, offer a detailed examination of these arguments. I will uh, first show that the first two, the PM and ZM arguments, depend on a mistake, mistaken assumption, which leads to invalid predictions. Therefore, it is not that the assumption of definite outcomes leads to trouble, but that such an assumption coupled with uh, 
this unwarranted assumption leads to inconsistent results. And regarding the FAR argument, I will show that even though it is written in a language which seems very different from the P, um, M and ZM arguments, uh, it uh, also depends on the same mistaken assumption. So um, the theory does not really show what it, what it tries to. Okay. All right. So um, given that introduction, this is the plan for the talk. I will uh, explain or, or present the PM and ZM arguments. Then I, I will show that they uh, depend on this uh, mistaken uh, assumption. It's a mis an assumption about uh, certain correlations. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about uh, that in detail. Then uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the FR arguments, and then I will end with my conclusions. OK, so um, let's start with this uh, PM argument. And the experimental setting considered uh, is as follows. We take a singlet, and then the two particles of the singlet are sent to two labs, A and B, where uh, observers A1 and, A A and B1 measure uh, their particles along directions, um, uh, lowercase a1 and b1. OK, after um, this first step, um, um, we involve two more observers, a2 and b2, who are um, supposed to be outside of the labs of a1 and b1. And, and what a2 and b2 do is to come and undo the measurements performed by a1 and b1. The idea behind this uh, undoing of the measurements is that um, since A1, I'm sorry, A2 and B2 are outside of the labs of A1 and B1, they basically can describe whatever happens inside their labs of A1 and B1 as a very complicated, but after all, just a some unitary evolution. So basically, they can, at this in principle, come and apply the inverse of that unitary, which would undo the measurements of A1 and B1. And after A2 and B2 undo this, these measurements, they um, take the particles and measure them along uh, A2 and B2 in uh, lowercase. OK, so that's uh, the experimental setting. And um, um, how is the, the actual argument constructed? Well, they uh, PM uh, assumes that all uh, observers um, involved in the experiment obtain actual obte objective uh, results when they measure. And as a result of that, um, there must exist a joint probability distribution for all the results, namely this uh, probability P of A1, B1, A2, B2. Um, and um, given that uh, there is such a probability distribution, then one can uh, calculate the marginal probabilities for a pair of results. And um, with those uh, marginal probabilities, one can uh, calculate the expectation values of uh, products of results, um, which are uh, what I call E uh, sub A, A1, B1, et cetera. And um, there's this um, well-known uh, theorem by Fine, which uh, shows that if one takes a joint probability distribution and from that one computes these expectation values, then such expectation values must satisfy the CHSH inequality, OK? so. The assumption of uh, there being a joint probability distribution leads to the CHSH inequality. OK, um, so that's uh, one part of the argument. But then um, one employs quantum mechanics to uh, make predictions for these expectation values. And uh, well, we, we start with uh, the simple ones. And that is the, the expectation values of the product of results between, say, A1 and B1 or A2 and B2. One notices that those expectation values um, simply correspond to a standard bear scenario, in which, uh, for example, uh, between A1 and B1, they receive a, a singlet, they make the, their measurements, So, um, and the same for uh, A2 and B2. So one concludes that the quantum prediction for these expectation values are simply given by um, the standard quantum uh, prediction. For the mixed correlations, that is the correlations between, say, A1 and B2 or uh, B1 and A2, one can uh, reason as follows. Uh, for example, A1 uh, measures its particle and updates uh, the state according to, to the result uh, it, it, um, um, uh, she, she obtained. Um, and then um, to um, calculate the correlation between that, res that result and the result of B2, she simply evolves the state um, on the other side. But of course, that evolution is simply a, a, an identity, right? Because B1 measures, but then B2 undoes that, that uh, evolution. So the state is um, uh, the same it was for um, 
for uh, the state of A1 relative to B2 is the same as it was for B1. So um, A1 concludes that the correlation between her measurement and B2's measurement also goes as minus the cosine of the difference of the angles. And the same, of course, for B1 and A2. The problem, of course, is that we know that um, these quantum predictions violate the CHSH uh, inequality. Therefore, we have a contradiction. In, um, in concrete terms, what we uh, arrive at is that the assumption that all measurements performed in the experiment yield definite objective outcomes is found to be incompatible with the quantum predictions. Okay? And from all this, it is concluded that quantum measurements um, or quantum measurement outcomes cannot be taken to be actual or objective. Okay, the ZM argument is um, very similar. And the difference is that instead of using Bell's arrangement, they use this the GHZ um, setting, which as I said, is a variant of Bell's uh, 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 argument which uses three uh, particles instead of two. So the, the idea is the same. And uh, we have uh, this extended Wigner's different scenario, but with the GHZ state. And um, what they note is that um, the results of, so they, they consider this experiment in which first the, the friends measure, then the, the Wigner's come and measure. And they note that uh, the results of the friend the friends in each of the wings must coincide with what the Wigners would have gotten in case the friends were removed, right? So if one particle is sent to one lab and instead of the friend measuring, Wigner comes and measures, then they know that Wigner um, would obtain the same uh, result that the friend would have gotten. And from that, they conclude that um, things like this are the case. Well, this, uh, um, what this means is that if, for example, we consider a case in which everybody measures, that is the three friends measure and then the three beginners come and measure, then the results of the, the probability for the results of, say, one beginner and two friends must um, be exactly the same as the probabilities for the results of all the beginners. Okay. And, um, but of course, um, uh, it is well known from the GHC uh, original argument that this assumption leads to trouble, leads to an inconsistency. So um, from this, they conclude that any attempt to introduce an actual outcome for the friend's measurements leads to a contradiction. Okay, so uh, basically the same conclusion as the PM argument. Okay, so let's start to uh, actually uh, analyze these uh, experiments in more uh, detail. So uh, we first note that um, um, they um, all depend on a key assumption, which is an assumption that I will call uh, the mixed correlations assumption, uh, which, um, for example, in the case of the PM argument, um, amounts to uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, amounts to um, this um, correlation. So it's a correlation between the measurement of uh, one friend and one beginner. So in this. Um, a case uh, between uh, say A1 and B2. And as I said, this correlation is taken to be given by basically the quantum prediction. And um, analog analogously in uh, the ZMA argument, one assumes that uh, again, this mixed correlation, that the correlations between measurements of, for example, two, uh, the, uh, two friends and one Wigner are exactly the same than the correlations between all the Wigners by themselves, right? So these two arguments, crucially depend on assuming these uh, mixed correlations, that the mixed correlations are given by the quantum predictions. And um, I think there are like two key questions to evaluate if this um, assumption is correct or not. First of, not, first of all, um, the question is uh, whether these mixed correlations are in fact the correct quantum predictions. And the second question is if uh, there is or if there could be empirical evidence for these mixed correlations. If any of two uh, of these two um, uh, questions is answered um, uh, with a yes, then um, one would be um, um, uh, yeah, one, one, one uh, get into trouble by using this uh, assumption in um, in in a, in a theorem. Okay, so um, before trying to answer uh, those two questions, let me just um, make a, 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 an observation. And that, that observation is that um, these arguments uh, have two key premises. Number one, um, the arguments need to assume a 
purely unitary evolution, even during measurements. Otherwise, of course, one would not be able to undo the experiments uh, as, as I um, explained how uh, one assumes that one can do in the PM um, argument. And, um, and then the second uh, premise, uh, which is uh, the key behind these arguments, is that one stipulates that all measurements actually uh, yield definite objective outcomes. The problem is that um, by modeling's uh, trilemma, one knows that these two premises are incompatible with a third uh, premise, uh, namely the claim that uh, quantum mechanics is uh, complete or that quantum state is complete. So by modeling's trilemma, um, if one wants to assume one and two, then one has to um, recognize that that implies the existence of uh, hidden variables in, in, in the system one, one is uh, considering. And of course, um, we know through uh, Bell's theorem and Cohen Specker's theorem that uh, hidden variables must be non local and contextual. Okay, so with this uh, information in at hand, we can go back and explore these um, two key questions behind the, the mixed correlations. And uh, the first one was whether these uh, mixed correlations are or not the correct uh, quantum predictions. What are the arguments? Um, to arrive at this conclusion uh, given by uh, PM and ZM? Well, um, in, in PM, what we uh, argued basically was that because the state um, um, relative to uh, the state uh, of A1 relative to B1 was the same as the state relative to B2, then the prediction must uh, coincide. And, and then uh, for um, in the ZM case, the argument for these mixed correlations was this counterfactual that if F does not measure, then W must obtain what F would have obtained uh, in case um, um, W is who measures, right? However, um, um, uh, we just, as we just saw, when um, is um, implicitly presupposing in these arguments uh, hidden variables. And of course, as I said, hidden variables are contextual and non-local. So um, um, with this in mind, we can um, see that these two arguments are in fact uh, not valid. Uh, for example, against uh, the first argument, we know that um, given that um, um, hidden variables are present, that predictions arise not simply from the state, but from the state plus the hidden variables and the context, even a remote context. So um, this straightforward argument simply uh, fails. And against two, um, the, the second argument, we know that um, the, the counterfactual seems true, but the, the point is that uh, by contextuality, um, if F indeed does measure, then um, that could change uh, the result of, uh, of W. So the fact that if F would not measure, then F, W would uh, obtain the same result that, as F is irrelevant to um, the right conclusions in the case in which F does measure, okay? So um, we conclude that uh, these two arguments uh, indeed fail. And, and, and in fact, the, 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 uh, the force be behind this, uh, this uh, objections against the, these arguments is the observation that um, in truth, quantum mechanics or standard quantum mechanics cannot uh, really make predictions for these mixed correlations. And the idea is that, um, we can come back uh, to this in, in the questions if you want, but the idea is that uh, the, um, basically the uh, uh, ambiguities or vague vagueness of the standard measurement, of the standard framework regarding uh, measurements um, forbids uh, precise and concrete predictions for these experiments using the standard uh, framework. Um, the other uh, key question was whether these um, uh, mixed correlations are empirically required. And um, my claim is that by construction, the mixed correlations cannot be empirically accessed. And then the point is that by undoing the measurements, uh, one um, completely erases all records. So um, one cannot really compare uh, the results of say A1 and B2. And more generally, it can be shown that any time order of the operations of say the PM experiment implies that at least one of the ex expectation values cannot be measured. Therefore, not satisfying these mixed correlations does not imply a clash with experiments. So um, uh, in sum, we conclude that not satisfying um, the mixed correlations does not, does not lead to trouble, which uh, was a key um, 
um, part of this argument. So we conclude that these arguments are not really valid. It's um, um, uh, useful to uh, illustrate all my claims with a, a concrete example. So uh, what I did is to take a pilot wave uh, theory and compute with that uh, the variable theory, the predictions for the PM, PM arrangement. And um, well, here are the, the results and just a, a few observations. First of all, we know that um, as, as expected, these mixed correlations, the A1, B2 and AB2, B1, A2 are not given by the quantum predictions. They are given by something else. Um, and uh, of course, uh, one can uh, show, which was a key part of the argument, that these uh, predictions do satisfy this CHSH uh, inequality. But of course, uh, doing so, since one cannot experimentally violate it with these sorts of experiments, does not lead to trouble. And then the other observation I want to make is that um, uh, as I said, the hidden variable theories are um, uh, explicitly non-local and contextual. So one could worry that one would be able to uh, use them to, uh, to do signaling, to send signals faster than light. In particular, for example, I can, one can uh, compute the correlations between, say, the measurement of A1 and A2, which are um, um, given by a term that has to do with the difference between the angle between A1 and A2, as one would expect. But note that this correlation depends also on the angle employed by B2. So it seems that um, A1 and B2 could communicate, could construct a, a protocol to communicate. For example, B2 can um, choose an angle such that it fully erases the correlation between the measurements between A1 and A2. So this could seem problematic. However, we remember that by construction, observers don't have access to um, correlations between their first and second measurements. For example, A1 and A2 cannot compare their results because A2 fully erased the, the records of A1. So basically, the conclusion is that even though it seems that one could use these things to, to send signals faster, faster than light, one in fact cannot do so. OK. Um, Let's um, now uh, say a few words about the FR arguments. As, as I said, the FR argument is um, uh, what motivated this, uh, these other two uh, experiments. Uh, it um, also employs an extended Wigner's friend scenario, this time based on Hardy's uh, arrangement, which is another variant of Bell's uh, theorem. And uh, this theorem is cast in terms of a uh, no-go theorem, which argues for the mutual incompatibility of three uh, um, premises, number uh, one C, which uh, stipulates the consistency between the observations of different uh, um, observers. Uh, S, which uh, stipulates that uh, measurements have single outcomes. And uh, Q, which uh, stipulates the universal validity of quantum mechanics, that is, that, that is valid at, at all scales. This um, argument is cast in terms of uh, epistemic notions, such as, for example, agents expressing certainty on such and such beliefs, or agents changing their beliefs and hearing the results of others, etc. And um, the point is that um, even though it is written in a very different language, it can be shown that it also depends exactly on the same mistaken um, mixed correlations assumptions as before. For example, in the theorem, one uses um, claims such as uh, if F uh, finds X, then she knows that W will find Y with certainty, which again, it can be seen as a, it's a mixed correlation. And the upshot of, of, of all this is that the theorem is not valid. OK, so to conclude, as I said, recent arguments try to challenge the ob objectivity of measurements. However, they depend on a mistake, mistaken assumption regarding mixed correlations. It is not then that the assumption of definite outcomes leads to trouble, but that so that such an assumption coupled with this unwarranted uh, assumption regarding mixed correlations leads to inconsistent results. And um, moreover, I um, show that this mistaken assumption can be tracked, uh, I'm sorry, traced to a lack of recognition that hidden variables with their inevitable contextual and non-contextual and non-local nature are uh, being postulated. We conclude from all this that these arguments fully fail in challenging the objectivity of measurements. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks Elias for this very interesting talk. And now, we have some time for questions. Please, if someone has a question, write it down uh, in the chat. Uh, Dennis, please go on. Yes. And, yeah. OK. Yes. Thank you for, for your talk. Uh, so you 
you speak a lot about objectivity, like all the authors, all the other authors who are involved in this discussion uh, do. But very often it's not so clear what objective actually means or, or what the authors intend. So you also use the term definite instead of objective. But I, I, I think that all the authors acknowledge that if someone makes a measurement, he or she will find a definite result. So there will be one result of which he or she will become uh, aware. But what is at issue in this so-called objectivity question is whether other observers looking at this system of the, of the first observation will see or observe or measure the same result. And what these inequalities seem to show is that that's <coughs> not uh, guaranteed. But that comes close to contextuality. So, so I think that the contextuality, which you emphasize, actually is very close to this non-objectivity between the quotation marks that's signaled by many of the authors. I'm, I'm not quite sure whether I made my, my question clear. So, yeah, do no, you? I, I, I think. Yeah. I think I think I, I do understand your point. But I'm not sure I would agree. I think that the objectivity um, uh, these authors have in mind, and it's also what I have in mind, is something like um, um, stipulating that um, after, say, I don't know, Alice measures, then the world is such that um, Alice obtained a result, and all observers agree on what that result was. And I think that that is independent from the measurement of Alice being or not contextual, which has to do with which actual results she obtained um, depending on the, the, the details of how she, she performed the experiment. So contextuality has to do with the result depending or not on the method to, to arrive at the result and objectivity on the result being the same for everybody. And, and what I, I think I showed is that um, while these arguments uh, argue that uh, one cannot assume uh, the sort of objectivity that I was uh, describing, that these uh, results are mistaken and they do not challenge at all any theory or at least uh, theories that uh, do hold objectivity in the in the sense that I, I described. I don't know if I, I I don't know if I understood your question if and if I was clear. Yeah, I, I think you understood my my question. Well, it is, it's a difficult question. So can can I ask one other thing? So I I remember from the description given by Healy, I think in a 2018 paper of the experiment proposed by Pussy and and and, and the other guy uh, that it was a bit more complicated than what you showed because they also involve. Uh, different frames of reference with different uh, time orders. Yeah, I think that that um, that Pussy and Masanes did not, as I, as far as I remember, uh, they did not uh, involve different uh, frame of references. Some other people did, but I think that uh, I mentioned at some point that one can show that regardless of the order of operations, that is, regardless of which frame of reference one one uh, employs one can conclude, for example, that one cannot experimentally prove the, the, the inequalities. So I have much more detail than what I was able to say in this 20 minutes talk, but I have uh, this uh, longish paper where I do mention uh, what happens if one uh, um, explores the, the issue from different points of view, etc. And, and I think that that does not change at all my conclusion. Okay, thank you. I will look at the paper. <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you. Thanks for your questions. Okay. Uh, we are almost on time, but we have uh, two more questions. Oh, one, one more question. I think that Jorge wanted to do a question. Please, Jorge, go on, but uh, I- Very, I, very I, short, okay. Very thanks, short, please, yes. Thanks, Elia, very interesting talk. Uh, one question. I, I think the, the quantum erasure is well known. You can measure in one direction and then erase the result based on a different basis. It seems to me that the main difference in this more sophisticated experiment from Frauschinger and Renner is because they put people there and you are kind of erasing what they saw 
And, and there have been some articles saying that it is very hard for a person to be in a Hadamard operator. Uh, have you seen that? How, what do you think about that? Well, that, let me just make a, a quick, uh, like a general comment. I, I, I don't think that um, in the same way that I, I don't think that these arguments have something really interesting to show about quantum foundations, I don't think that the quantum eraser has something interesting to show. I think it's just uh, um, the, the weird uh, assumption, uh, the weird uh, conclusions that are, are derived are only uh, derived because one employs a non self consistent the theory, such as the standard arguments, the standard framework. So if one analyzes those uh, settings with a theory that resolves the measurement problem, then one notices that there's nothing really strange going on. And yeah, I, and, and, and about this uh, one having to have uh, people in, inside, etc. The, the, the point behind these arguments is that even though one cannot um, do that in practice, that if one assumes quantum mechanics to be a, like a complete theory and, and uh, valid at all scales, then one can at least in principle consider these, uh, these alternatives and see what they uh, imply. Yeah, I'm sorry, my, my answer was a quick, we, maybe we can talk about this uh, later more. Okay, okay. People, I have to uh, cut you off because